another uh, edition of our midweek recharge. Always wonderful to connect with you and see how your week is going and let you know how our week is going here. Our, uh, our practice is the same each week. We're going to start out praying for our nation and the things that are going on there. And then we'll spend some time in the book of Psalms. We'll spend some time talking about good news, things that are going on in here in the country. And today we're going to add a new feature of our Wednesday night get together, maybe a way for us to connect a little bit more. So we always pray for our president and our vice president. We're praying for our local leaders to make sure that they make the best decisions. But now since we're moving into the middle of August and clearly the November election is heating up, it's time for us to pray for our new election. At church, I don't think our job is to get involved in politics, but I will point out to you that as you are considering who to vote for, you need to consider candidates that stand up for scriptural principles. And uh, the Democratic Party just decided to uh, uh, solidify their nominations. And so they picked Camilla Harris as the vice president running mate. She is a very pro-abortion uh, candidate. And so uh, Joe Biden is also. And so when it comes closer to the election, you need to be doing some research and to find out which candidates are pro-life which candidates will stand behind the principles that we believe in here. And so make sure that you do your research on some of those things. So we're going to add another dimension to our opening, not only praying for our current leaders, but praying for the direction of our country come November, making sure that uh, God is in control of this election and in control of our country. So we'll still be able to do what we're doing, which is preach the message and the story of Jesus Christ. Uh, let's open up with a word of prayer. Father. Things are starting to get interesting here as both sides of the aisle, the Republicans and the Democrats, are getting ready to begin kind of their, uh, um, their campaign to get our votes between now and November. And so, Father, we just pray in advance that you will be in control of this election. We want to have men and women that uh, run for office and win their office that are pro-life, that are pro-Bible, that are pro-free speech, so that we'll be able to continue to talk about you and be able to do it without any worries or fear that our speech is going to be limited. And Lord, we would love to have that abortion ruling removed and that uh, life, as we begin, as we believe it begins at conception, we'll be able to um, have a chance. And so we pray for the November election. We're going to start praying for that every week now, Lord, between now and November. But in the here and now, we pray for our leaders, we pray for our president and our vice president and our governor and our lieutenant governor as they try to figure out what's best for us. Pray too for the folks that are so, I guess, panicked by the things that are going on. Pray that our leaders will help our nation become calm in the midst of crisis and that the decisions that they make will be wise and that they will think about all aspects of their decision, whether it's the people involved or the children when it comes to going back to school, the economics that are also tied into all of it. Very difficult decisions. And so we just pray that you will give our leaders grace and wisdom so that they can make the best decisions for us. Now we pray for us, Lord, as we spend some time together. Encourage us as we look into the word. Bless us throughout our time together, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are motoring our way through the book of Psalms. It's a wonderful book. We have made our way up to Psalm 75. Uh, this is Asaph, and he says, We give thanks to you, O God. We give thanks for your name is near. Men tell of your wonderful deeds. You know, I told you last week, I got to talk about one of his wonderful deeds. So this whole getting old thing, this 65 is, is, is challenging. And so I've been looking for this title for my motorcycle and I cannot find it. I have torn apart every drawer in my house. If my wife is in rehab right now and if she was home, she would be very unhappy with me because I've got every drawer pulled apart, paperwork all over the place. I'm trying to find this title, I can't find it. It's driving me crazy. So I'm coming into the presence of the king saying, Lord, I'd really like to find this. And I'm going to tell of his wonderful deeds. So I had this bin in my office that says Lance's important papers. That's where it should be. I have looked through that thing two or three times. It's not in there. Yesterday, I spent the whole day really saying, Lord, help me find this. I go through that same bin yesterday, the third time or fourth time that I've gone through it. And there it is. There's the title. 
I honestly believe that an angel found it out in the garage and put it in that bin for me. So I am telling of his wonderful deeds. My God is in the miracle business just like he was back then. Verse 9, he says, As for me, I will declare this forever, all of whom God is. I will sing praise to the God of Jacob. Psalm 76, Asaph once again, and here he's talking about God in, in terms that we sometimes don't think of in the busyness of our days. He says, God, you are resplendent with light. That's, a, that's, a, that's an impressive word. We don't use it enough, but I like the way it sounds. You are resplendent with light. More majestic than mountains rich with game. You alone are to be feared. Who can stand before you when you are angry? Our country needs to think about some of that. From heaven you pronounce judgment and the land feared and was quiet. When you, O God, rose up to judge, to save all the afflicted of the land, surely your wrath against men brings you praise. Psalm 77, once again, Asaph, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and my soul refused to be comforted. This is clearly a cry coming from somebody who's desperate, who needs the Lord's help. If you're watching this with me, I, I, I can't help but think you feel the same way I do. I see what's going on in the world. I'm worried about the things that I see. I mean, since we were together last week, Chicago's like falling apart. I mean, they're rioting every night. There's a, a shopping district down there called the Magnificent Mile, and they're just, they're literally driving cars into storefronts so they can go in there and steal. I see those things happening, and I realize that the solution for all this is a relationship with Jesus Christ. And I'm worried, too, because I don't see enough Christians being burdened by that. Our voices should be shouting above the things that are going on because that's what they need. They need the message of Jesus Christ. And so Asaph was plagued to the point where he said, In distress I seek the Lord. At night I'm stretching out untiring hands. My soul refuses to be comforted. We need to be burdened and broken by the things that are going on in our world and like Asaph, crying out saying, Lord, help us. Rise up. Speak to men's and women's hearts. Continuing on, he says, I remembered you, O God, and I groaned. I mused and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago, I remembered my songs in the night. My heart mused and my spirit inquired. Will the Lord reject us forever? Will he never show us his favor again? He just felt so far from him. Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? But then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years of the right hand of the Most High, I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. Your ways, O oh God, are holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who performs miracle. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeem the people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. And then he starts thinking about some of those miracles. And he said, the waters saw you, O God. The waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds poured down water. The skies resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea, your way through the mighty waters. Though your footprints were not seen, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Is that your God? I hope so. It's when you remember his power and the things that he has done. Yes, in the past. 
it helps you become bolder in approaching and asking him things in the present. That's why you'll read through these Old Testament passages and they're still talking about the miracles around the Red Sea, about the time when the, the children of Israel were removed from Egypt. Because those miracles remind us of his power. And so even though years had passed, they still talk about it. Even though thousands of years have passed, we still talk about it because it should encourage you and me to pray big things. I've been hoping and praying that this pandemic will be something that will do two things. One, it will draw people to God because they're worried. They don't know what's going to happen. And in that worry and in that fear that they would turn back to the one that can calm those fears. But the second thing that I've been hoping and praying for is that Christians will wake up. I think that too many Christians are, are suffering from apathy. This is a time for us to stand up and make a difference, whether it's through online, through our social media pages, in our neighborhoods. We need to be telling people that there is hope and telling them why it is that we're able to get through each day, even though we don't know what's going to happen. I just get up each day and say, this is the Lord's day. And whatever's going to happen, I trust that he'll be in control of it. And that message needs to be shouted from the rooftop. So if you're a Christian and you've been just kind of sitting on the sidelines through all this, it is time for you to take action. The scripture uses words for us like soldiers likens us to being in a war. My friends, there is warfare going on out there, and it's time for good soldiers to rise up. What can help you do it? Like Asaph. Look back at your own life and think of the things that God has done for you, the ways that he has worked the miraculous. And when you think about those things, and listen, it doesn't just always have to be Red Sea miracles. I wasn't kidding. I honestly believe an angel found that title out in the garage somewhere where it was and put it in that bin. Now you may think, okay, he's lost his mind. I don't think so. I think our God's in the miracle business. Red Sea miracles, lost title miracles, loss of hope and a heart comforted miracles. When you think about those things, it encourages you, like Asaph did, to run into his presence in distress to seek the Lord, at night to stretch out untiring hands and say, Lord, I need help with a soul that refuses to be comforted until God does, in fact, do what it is that you need him to do. But that's a good psalm. That's Psalm 77, if you guys want to read about that. But he continues. Here's Psalm 78. So he's just talking about all of these things that God has done, and he's remembering them. Then he says, verse 1 of 78, O oh, my people, hear my teaching. Listen to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter hidden things from old, what we have heard and known, what our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children. We will tell the next generation. We have this, I guess some people would like to use the word opportunity, but I think it's deeper. I think it's an obligation to tell the kids that are coming Behind us, all the things that God's done for us. If you're not excited about the things of God, how do you expect the kids that are watching you to be excited about the things of God? If you're not serving him, how do you expect them to serve him? So Asa is saying, we're not going to hide them from the children. We're going to tell them. What are we going to tell them? The praiseworthy deeds of the Lord. His power and his wonders that he has done. His statutes the laws that he established, those that he commanded our forefathers to teach their children so the next generation would know them, even the children yet to be born, and they in turn would tell their children. Then they would put their trust in God and would not forget his deeds, but would keep his commands. So here's this idea that Asaph remembers everything that God has done, and then he remembers his responsibility to tell his kids so that they can tell other kids. I think sometimes Satan has done such a great job of getting us so busy that we forget to pass this on to the next generation. 
I mean, prior to the pandemic, parents were so busy taking their kids from one lesson to one practice after another that they didn't have time. I propose that this slowing down of things is a great opportunity for parents to pass on all of this stuff, get them excited about God, about serving God, about making a difference for him. Asaph thought it was a great idea. So do I. Let's take a moment and pray for our country and for Christians that we might remember these things and that we might remember that we have responsibility. I know those are words that people don't like to use these days. Pastor, people are going to start turning off. You mentioned obligation and responsibility in a 20-minute period of time. Have you lost your mind? My friends, the scripture is full of those words. We have a responsibility to tell others about him. I mean, the last thing that Christ said to us before he left to go back into heaven was go into all the world and preach the gospel. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I've commanded. Responsibility, obligation. And now it's more personal. Parents, grandparents have an obligation, a responsibility to tell them to their kids and grandkids so that they'll be able to tell others. Father, I thank you for these words today. Then Asaph was struggling with something. He was in despair. He stayed up all night lifting his hands to you. His soul couldn't get comforted because he had a problem. I think there are a lot of us that are feeling like that today, Lord. What's next? We, we're just about getting through the summer, and pretty soon the next flu season is going to be knocking on the door. What's going to happen with that? There's all kinds of rumors of the next virus coming out of China. You can almost feel the nervousness rising in people. Schools might not open. It'd be just virtual learning. Parents don't know what to do. And all of this is boiling beneath the surface. Asaph knew what to do. He came into your presence and said, Lord, help. And then when he started thinking that maybe help wouldn't come, he remembered all the things that you've done from the parting of the Red Sea to the promises that you kept. And that encouraged him to ask you to help. And then in the very next writing, he says, I want to make sure, too, that I pass this on to the children who will then pass it on to other children. Lord, I pray for parents that are watching right now, maybe parents, maybe grandparents, maybe aunts, uncles, friends. Remind them of this opportunity slash obligation to tell the next generation about you what you've done in the past, what Jesus Christ did for us, what you're doing for us right now, and what is our future. So that they'll be excited about those things and they'll tell their classmates, they'll tell their children when they rise up. Father, I just pray that we might use this kind of course change that we've been forced into, that we'll use this course change for you, that we'll use this time where we've slowed down to pray more, to look for opportunities to reach out, to get onto Facebook and some of these social media outlets and not just read what's happening, but to post something about our faith, to let people know where we stand, to use these opportunities to make a difference. Help us, Lord, to make sure that we do that. Pray these things, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so what's going on here at church? Let me get out my little list. Well, this Saturday, August the 15th, is our 25th annual Corn Fest. <laughs> nah. <laughs> no, we're not having it. And I am heartbroken by it because I love that festival. I love meeting all the people that we don't normally get a chance to have contact with, but no Corn Fest this year. We have been telling you, though, that our local township is going to have a fireworks celebration. So if you come here to our church, Literally just go right up the street. Two blocks is a little elementary school, Salamant Elementary. You can find a place anywhere there in their, um, their facilities. Uh, plenty of place for social distancing. And I'll tell you, they put on an amazing fireworks display for a small little township. You will enjoy it. So head out here. You can park in our church parking lot and literally just walk up the road if you want. They're going to have refreshments and things. Uh, so put that on your list uh, for this Saturday. 
uh, August the 15th, but Corn Fest number 25, Lord willing, that will be back next year, so put that on your list. Here at church, both Sunday morning and Sunday night, we are open to the public if you want to stop by and visit, uh, and we will continue to post all of our sermons online so we can stay connected with you. And then if you're coming by to visit this Sunday, uh, plan on staying a little bit longer because we're going to have our church picnic. We have a couple lots around the church, and one of them right across the street from the church that we have picnic tables set up on. And we're going to go over there. We're going to have an old-fashioned kind of a Chicago-style hot dog cookout. We did this last year. All the fixings that go on a Chicago-style hot dog from cucumbers to peppers to tomatoes, all the kind of stuff. We'll have all those fixings there for you. And we'll throw in a couple burgers also because we got some of our church family there. Not big fans of hot dogs. I don't understand it. And yes, they'll be all beef hot dogs. I don't like those chicken-pork combinations. Uh, so come on out. And uh, worship with us Sunday morning at 11, and then stay for the picnic that'll be following. And then, of course, in the evening, you're welcome to come back. Six o'clock is our evening service, and uh, welcome to be a part of that with us also. Wednesdays will continue to just be online, and so that's kind of our schedule for the month. Um, one thing I want to add for Wednesday night, uh, something kind of new. Maybe you've got a question about our country, about the virus about politics in general, about how the church responds to that. Maybe you have a biblical question of something that's been weighing on your mind. I'm going to add a new section on Wednesdays called Ask the Pastor. Uh, you just go to our website, send me one of those questions, and each week I'll try to answer one of those questions, and, uh, and maybe that will help you. That's something that you've been struggling with for a long time. I want to use these Wednesday nights for us to get to know each other a little bit better. And so if you want to you know, ask that question, send it to me, and I'll keep telling you about the miracles that I get, whether they're big or small. Listen, I honestly believe that God is still in the miracle business. I do. I don't think I'd be sitting here if I didn't. Because I honestly believe when I tell you that God can help get you through whatever it is that you're struggling with, whether he gets you through it emotionally or carries you each step of the way, I believe he can do it. And so keep connecting with us uh, so that uh, you don't find yourself getting discouraged. All right, what about some things to pray for? My wife, Cheryl, had shoulder replacement surgery Monday. Uh, she came through that well. She's now in rehab for uh, probably about a week, but just keep praying for her. Obviously, no infection. Pray that, you know, they start moving those joints right away. That I, I, don't, I don't get that, uh, but uh, keep praying for her as she recuperates. Our church family that's still going through difficulties, Ray and Tracy, you know, we've been praying for them. Our friend Nancy, we have another friend Janet. All of them are in some form of um, chemo treatment. Um, so pray for them. And then also uh, J.J. Beeler down in Florida. Uh, she's having both chemo and radiation. So make sure you keep praying for those folks. And then Karen Bagley uh, uh, texted me and said uh, her granddaughter, uh, one of her granddaughters is heading off to college, and so pray for her and the family and how that is when the child goes off to school. It's kind of nervous for the kid as they take off, and then, of course, kids have no idea how bad it is for us, uh, the nerves that we go through. So let's take a moment and pray for some of those. Anything else coming, guys? Are we good so far? That's it? All right. Let's just pray for these. Lord, we have these ongoing things that we are burdened by. And like Asaph, we're coming into your presence because we refuse to be comforted because we want these answers to prayer. We want Ray's kidneys to wake up so he doesn't have to keep going to dialysis. We want the doctors to have wisdom so that Tracy won't have any more seizures. They'll be able to find out what caused the, the strokes and the blood clots. We need her back to full health so she can continue to do what she was doing which is to care for her husband in an incredible way. And then, Lord, we have several folks, this JJ down in Florida, we've got Janet, we've got Nancy, all in different forms of cancer treatment, some radiation, some chemo, some aftercare. Lord, we're praying for all of these. We want miracles. We want, that, we want the cancer to be gone. Now, why are we asking these bold things? Because we're just reading about a God who parted the Red Sea. And a million people walked across on dry ground. We believe that happened. I don't believe that's just some story that was written down. I believe it actually happened. And we talk about it today because then we are encouraged to ask big things. 
I believe literally you could touch Ray's kidneys right now and they would start functioning at 100%. These folks that we're praying for, Lord, use these treatments that we have to get into the place where they can be cancer free. Father, we have no place to turn but to you. And so we ask that you might rise up and intercede for these requests of ours. We pray for Karen's granddaughter and all of the folks that are sending their kids off to school during these kind of uncertain times. So many colleges are just having virtual. Some are having some on campus, some off. So much uncertainty, and that makes it more difficult for the parents. And so we pray for uh, the Bagley household that you'll give them comfort. Pray for them as they kind of start on this new journey of life. And then for Cheryl Lord, thank you for getting her through that surgery. And now we just pray that you'll keep any infection away from her. Help her, Lord, as she begins to uh, do the rehab necessary to get that new joint working. I thank you that we live in this day and age where they literally just replace all of these body parts. I grew up watching a TV show where it seemed like uh, fantasy, the six million dollar man. And now we live in a day and age where they replace knees and hips and shoulders and pretty incredible. So Lord, we thank you for those advances, but at the same time, we still need you to watch over, protect, keep us from infection and all those other things. So we leave all these folks in your hands, Lord, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, how about a piece of good news? So, you know, the world is trying to tell us that there's all this hatred between black and white and there's racism everywhere that you turn. And I think the news tries to fan that flame. And I want you to understand that is not the case. This country is filled with loving people who care for one another and they don't care what the color of your skin is. And so I followed this story. This was out of Chester Township, Pennsylvania. And so they had a lot of rain and this river began, began to rise. And then pretty soon it got to the place where it was a raging torrent. And so there's a guy filming this river. He couldn't believe how it was just racing across the road. And he looks up the road and he sees a guy coming. And you know how it is sometimes. You think, well, maybe the water isn't as deep or as fast as it seems. And you're trying to get home and you don't want to try to find a back road. And sometimes in these rural areas, that bridge might be the only way home. So this guy watches the car coming and he's videoing it. And you can find it on YouTube. It pops up right away. Just put Chester County Rescue. And he sees the car coming and he's saying to himself, he's going, no, don't do it. Don't do it. And the car keeps coming. And pretty soon he watches the water hit it and the car just sweeps off and disappears from the guy's view. So he's panicking. What am I going to do? So he, he doesn't know how to get down there. What happens to be right at that moment, there was a guy coming up with an end loader. And so... There's three or four other people there. It turns out that there were five guys, five rescuers that hop in this end loader and they start heading across this river. It's a section of Pennsylvania. There was no cell service, so they couldn't get anybody. So the end loader was able to make it across this bridge and then he's filming and they get to this car and luckily it was swept off towards the river, but there was a fence there and it was trapped against the fence. Now here's the interesting part of the story. The five people in the car, all African-Americans. The five people on the rescue team, all white. And you didn't hear any of them saying, oh, I'm sorry, you're African-American, I'm leaving. That's what the media wants you to think. There are wonderful people in this world that want to help one another. And these five guys put their lives on the line. So they're still videotaping. So they pull the end loader as close as they could get. At one point, the dad is holding his youngest daughter and the water is just raging. And you know if this fence gives way, that's it. And so he's able to reach off and you see the rescuer kind of reach the daughter and pull her in. And then, so there was five people in the car too. So two of the kids got up on the roof and they're hugging each other and crying because they think they're not going to make it. And so they get those two off. And then there's another, maybe, I don't know, maybe... 10, 12-year-old boy, he gets out of the car and the river is pushing him so hard. The rescuers are, don't move. Anyway, they get there, they get him out, they get the dad out, and they get everybody to safety. And this is a wonderful story of the stuff that happens all the time because we have people in this country that truly care about one another. It's another reason why I'm always warning you to be careful of what you read on the news. They'll, they try to make it seem like every police officer that pulls up is a racist. That is just not the case. Just like the other side tries to make you seem that every African-American is a racist. That is just the media trying to inflame things for ratings. The truth is, 
It's a great country that we live in with great freedoms and it's filled with great people. And so you got to make sure that you find those kind of stories and read them. I've watched that video two or three times just to be encouraged. There's so much negative in the world. When you find those good things, you got to jump on it. You got to watch it. Uh, the rescuer was being interviewed afterwards and he said, I can't wait to a couple of years from now to re-meet that family and to see what we were able to do by simply putting our selves at the right place and the right time. Just wonderful stuff that's going on in our world. So I don't want you to ever forget that. All right, let's do one last psalm and we'll finish up this, uh, this Psalm 78. So he's talking about um, how the forefathers would teach their children so that the next generation would know. And then verse 7, so that they would put their trust in God. So we're passing this information on to our kids for a reason. We want them to have the same faith and hope and peace and joy that we have. And so we need to do that. So that they would put their trust in God and they would not forget his deeds and they would keep his commands and not be like their forefathers. Because you know, if you've studied at all the nation of Israel, boy, they struggled. They would be in tune with God and then like, seemed like the next week they were worshiping false idols. He even says it in here, he calls them a stubborn and rebellious generation whose hearts were not loyal to God, whose spirits were not faithful to him. They forgot what he had done, the wonders that he had shown them. He did miracles in the sight of their fathers, in the land of Egypt, the division of the sea, the water standing firm like a wall, how he guided them with a cloud by day and light from the fire at night how he split rocks in the desert to give them water, how he brought streams out of the rocky crag. Yet they continued to sin against him, rebelling in the desert against the Most High. Verse 22, they didn't believe in God or trust in his deliverance. And so Asaph is saying, I don't want this to happen to the next generation, so I want to pass on to them who he is, what he's done, so that they will trust in him. Hey, thank you for being here with us. I hope you tune in each week and continue to share it or put out an invite. We need every opportunity that we have to be together, to look into the world. I mean, into the word, because the world is trying to put so much pressure on us. So good thing about this is we'll post this video. You can watch it again if you didn't get to watch all of it. Uh, and I encourage you, reread some of these Psalms that I've read. Uh, see for it yourself and be encouraged by what's there. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you so much for these sounds. Man, powerful truths today. Asaph needed you. We need you. He encouraged himself by remembering all of your powerful, wonderful deeds. We need to make sure that we do the same thing. And then, of course, we need to make sure that we pass those on to the next generation so that they, too, can put their hope in you. Thank you for that tonight, Lord. Pray for people that are watching, perhaps that are discouraged. Lead them to your word so that they can find encouragement. Bring back to their mind some miracle that you did for them. And Lord, of course, remind them about what Jesus Christ did for them when he gave his life on a cross. Thank you for all these things. Until next time, Lord, watch over us and protect us. Keep COVID far away. We need you and we leave ourselves in your hands and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Sunday morning at 11, and then, of course, the picnic to follow, and then fireworks on Saturday night at dusk. If you'd like to be a part of us, see you then.